Hello, everyone. Welcome to the, one of the last sessions of this KubeCon. Thanks for sticking it up. Today's session is going to be on smarter golden signals. My name is Anusha Raghunathan, and my co-presenter is Venkat Gunapati. And both of us are principal engineers working on the Kubernetes platform infrastructure at Intuit. Today, we'll be talking about what we are here for, which is smarter golden signals. Why we went about exploring this project. What does it mean to have cluster golden signals? Anomaly detection for a Kubernetes cluster and tools that we explored. We'll introduce you to Numa Proj, a new open source project that has been incubated at Intuit. And finally, finish it off with a demo and takeaways. For those who don't know about Intuit, Intuit is a fintech platform company that's popularly known for building financial products and services around tax prep and filing, accounting and payroll, such as QuickBooks, credit score analysis using Credit Karma, and small medium business marketing tools with MailChimp. And all of these financial services run on our Kubernetes-based infrastructure. Now, if you want to take a look at the numbers at a glance, we run about 275 Kubernetes clusters. They are mid-sized clusters that have about 20,000 plus namespaces, and they serve about 2,500 production services. I want to call out that these are just production services, and we have a lot of pre-prod environments for QA, perf testing, and whatnot. And this is about 900 developer teams and serving about 6,000 developers, more than 6,000 developers. And some of this is also seasonal traffic that will go up more than what these numbers are. And if you look at what a platform engineer does to observe the Kubernetes fleet that I was just mentioning, we have several different components in a Kubernetes cluster that we monitor. At a pretty high level, we have the node level components for CPU, memory, disk, network, processes. Then we have the Kubernetes components themselves and then follow that up with pod state information and finally some synthetic monitoring that we run. And synthetic monitoring is mainly for launching on-demand tests so that we can make sure that maybe a particular workload is running, particular type of networking workload is running, and so on. So what are the metric sources for all of these? For your node information, we use Telegraph. For Kubernetes, we use Prometheus. For pod state, we use kube state metrics, and for synthetic monitoring, we use a, a tool called Active Monitor, which is incubated at Intuit using under the Keiko Proj umbrella of projects. And all of these generate alerts. And when they do generate alerts, the platform engineer or the SRE that's on call is getting an overdose of all of these alerts. And they're frantically looking at a bunch of run books, looking at dashboards, making sure that things are working OK, trying to mitigate and remediate as we go. Now note that, as I mentioned earlier, the scale is quite high. There are about 275 plus clusters, and each cluster generates about 100 plus alerts. So you do the math. It's, it's going to be not too happy. Our platform engineer is getting a little overwhelmed here. Now, to make things a little interesting, let's throw in an incident. Who here likes to be on an incident call? Okay, nobody. You do? You work for PagerDuty? <laughs> so, um, 
Now the platform engineer not only has to worry about mitigation, but they're, they're also concerned about does, this, does, does the services that are impacted running on clusters that are healthy or unhealthy, they also need to understand whether this incident, is this a service issue or is this a platform issue? And they also need to understand what the blast radius of the incident is. If this service is down in one cluster, is it going to affect the rest of the clusters as well? Is it just a matter of time? That's how they're feeling right now. They are not just a little overwhelmed, they're literally drowning in alerts. I, I, I'm, I'm sure many of you can relate to this because that's how I feel when I go on call. And what the platform engineer really wants is very simple ways to reduce MTTD and MTTR. They want less positive, uh, less uh, false positives and less false negatives. When I get an alert, I want to be actually only alerted when there is a real problem. And I also want a few good quality signals. I don't, I want to filter signal from noise. And I might also like some tulips. So let's talk about cluster golden signals. That's the motivation behind us exploring this concept of cluster golden signals. Now, golden signals is a, not a new concept. When you have a service, whether it's a microservice running on Kubernetes or a service running elsewhere, the health of a service can be determined using four metrics, four sort of signals, high level signals. Google SRE Handbook released this a few years ago, as some of you might be familiar with. And uh, they talk about these four golden pillars, uh, which are error rates, latency, saturation, and requests or traffic. So with getting a good, few good signals from, uh, on all these four pillars, you can actually determine whether a, whether a service is healthy or not. So we realized that, hey, you know, it applies to services. Can we map that to Kubernetes clusters as well? So as a service owner that's running on the Kubernetes powered infrastructure, the service owner's concerns, yes, we do offer a lot of bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, they care about three very high-level fundamental things. They care about availability, they care about scale, and they care about correctness. So we were looking to see if we can map this cleanly to Kubernetes components. And we realized that, yes, we can. For availability, you can map it to the control plane, and you can probe a few things in there. Uh, along with networking, which is pretty fundamental to availability. And then for scale, you can map it pretty cleanly to cluster autoscaler, horizontal pod autoscaler, and VPA, if you have implemented VPA. And finally, you can map correctness to cluster authentication, uh, cluster networking, again, in terms of la latency and packet loss. And maybe you have some very custom cluster add-ons that actually give you some of the correctness. In our, in our case, all of the Kubernetes clusters, we slap on about like two dozen plus cluster add-ons that are helpful for day two operations, for security compliance, and, and so on. So let's take a look at what these golden signals translate to for us. So every golden signal that emanates from a Kubernetes cluster, the top Uber golden signals, can have three distinct states. They can either be healthy, which means that all the components that we are probing for are healthy. And they can be in a degraded state, which means that e like all of the critical components should be healthy. Even if one of them turned to be a degraded state, then we mark them as degraded. And finally, critical when even one of these components, again, turn critical, then the entire Uber signal is marked critical. Now, let's take a look at what the error golden signal looks like for us. This is a sample Prometheus rule that we've written, which is basically an aggregation of all of the golden signals that we cared about. So for example, autoscaler, networking, and, and so on. 
And you will see that the, the, the aggregation rule, you can actually customize it to how you need it. But in our case, we just aggregated and normalized it over a particular number range. Now, let's take a closer look at the individual golden signal for a particular component. In this case, we're talking about node local DNS. Node local DNS, as we all know, is very crucial for making your DNS lookups within your services. And if that fails, then you can be rest assured that your availability and your correctness are going to go down. So what we do is node local DNS has, we have Prometheus rules that make sure that node local DNS's success SLAs are being met. And how do we calculate the success SLA? So we, use, we look at the response total, and then we calculate the, any surfail errors over a preset period of time. So for example, in the last five minutes, how many surfail errors did we get over the total number of responses? And that's going to be your error rate. And then we subtract 100 from that, and that's going to be your success rate SLA. And a simple way to bucket this would be, hey, if your success rate is over 99, then you're healthy. If you're below 95, you're unhealthy. If you're anywhere in between, then you are in a degraded state. Another way to look at error rates is using error counts. So some of these components that, that we monitor, add-ons or whatnot, um, come up with error counts instead of error rates. So for example, we have a CNI component. It's from AWS. And uh, there are three distinct uh, components that make up the uh, CNI health. One is the AWS API error count. Another is the IPAMD error count. And then the final one is the pod ENI error count. So what we do is basically we look at the error counts for all of these components. And then we're like, OK, fine. If the error count for this particular component over the last five minutes is lesser than two, then hey, you know, it reconciled eventually, and then yes, it's going to be okay. Um, if it's over five, then hey, it's been reconciling, but never got to get out of that error. So hey, you know, maybe it's unhealthy. Anywhere between two and five, maybe degraded. So we came up with these rules, and that's that's what uh, the CNI looks like, and we did this for pretty much all of the critical components that we thought were responsible for the error rate. And um, we rolled it out. And we found a few things. We thought all of our clusters were one size fits all, as far as error rates were concerned. And um, we found they weren't. In fact, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and workloads. Some clusters, like the TurboTax clusters, are very seasonal. They are super busy from January through April of every year when tax peak is really high in the US. And uh, some have variable workloads throughout the day. For example, QuickBooks, it's our accounting software. So people log in at 9 AM, log off at 5 PM. So it's super busy during US uh, daytimes. And then it's like super not so busy in the evenings. And then there are specific platform clusters that run our stream processing, build, build processing, and um, like machine learning workloads that have like super high volume. And, uh, but they're not long-lived pods. They're more like jobs that get scheduled, and then they basically go down. So every uh, cluster is so unique in their workloads. So how are our static Prometheus thresholds going to work for these dynamic changing workloads, right? So what we, what we ended up having was, hey, the concept of cluster golden signals worked out fine, but it's not going to work with static thresholds because every cluster is unique. So then we said, how are we going to do this without static thresholds? And that's when we started doing, exploring anomaly detection. And anomaly detection is basically, and I'm going to quote a SysDig blog here that specifically, I like this definition. It says, anomaly refers to an outlier in a given data set that's polled specific to an, an environment. And it's a deviation from a confirmed pattern. And anomaly detection is about identifying ano these anomalous observations. So a set of data points will collectively help detect anomalies. 
So we said, okay, let's explore anomaly detection where we can specifically look at signals in a cluster and say, hey, yeah, this, is, this works for this cluster and this doesn't work for another cluster. And also note that the 275 clusters that I'm talking about is a mix of prod and pre-prod environments. So of course, like we all know, prod clusters are not very tolerant to errors or latency issues, whereas your pre-prod environments are okay and, and, and so on. So we wanted to also have that error tolerance treated differently. So we explored the concept of z-scores for anomaly detection. Now, z-scores, as you might all um, probably know, is pretty standard uh, statistical model to detect uh, the, the, it's basically a mean-based approach where you have a normal distribution of data and then you figure out the average and you get a z-score for a particular a point in time. And it's based on the data set that has already existed. So you get a baseline and then you say, hey, this new data that I'm getting, is, does that look like any of my old data or not? And the thing with the z-score calculation is that you can do, you can get a z-score metric for the current data point using a pretty standard formula. So it's basically the current uh, metric value minus the average over time divided by the standard deviation. And it works pretty well. Like you can say, hey, an anomaly is detected if the value is between, uh, it, it, it's over the three to minus three range. It's normal if it's below one and minus one. And if it's, uh, it's, it's slightly anomalous if it's over two and minus two. So that's, that's the standard mapping that you get from, from Z-score. You can look up any statistical uh, model paper and they'll tell you more details about what Z-scores are. Now the problem with Z-score, yes, so we explored this, we experimented with some of our error metrics um, that we wanted to propagate as cluster golden signals, and here's what happened. There were several pros. It's very well understood. Z-scores are very well understood. and. Uh, they provide cluster-specific anomaly detection, yes. And um, guess what? It's also available as part of uh, Prometheus as a native primitive. So you can actually write alert rules pretty straightforward. Well, what are the cons? Z-score actually assumes a normal distribution. So it assumes that there's going to be a bell curve. and uh, if, it, But in real life, bell curve data doesn't exist all the time. In fact, real world data is very different from, from a bell curve. So what happens is when there is a slope, then like when your data is actually trending on the downward spike and there is an anomaly there, Z-score just averages everything and says, oh, OK, yeah, you don't have an anomaly because you know, like your average over the last five minutes is going to be um, um, not, not so different from this, this spike, and then so it doesn't detect the anomaly there. So it's perfectly good for a normal distribution, but, but anything else, it's going to have issues uh, identifying the anomaly. And the second, yeah, so the, this is what the Gaussian distribution I was talking about. And um, in, if you want to overcome this Gaussian distribution issue, then you have to get data from weeks and weeks worth so that you can say, hey, oh, okay, so we can average it over and over, and then we have to store the data over several weeks, and then we have to understand this a lot better. And honestly, this was just not working for us. So we were looking for an anomaly detection tool for cluster golden signals on Kubernetes that, were, that was reliant and re reliable and at good technical fit. And that's how we landed on Numa Proj. So Numa Proj is a open source project that has been incubated at Intuit. And it is meant for real-time analytics and AI ops on Kubernetes. And uh, since they are part of the larger the platform team that we are, we, we are uh, part of as well, uh, we work closely with them to basically get the cluster golden signals and anomaly detection for those. Now, Numa Proj has a few different projects, but the main core ones are Numa Flow, which is massively, which handles massively high real-time jobs, and stream, and it's a stream processing engine. And Numa Logic, which is a collection of ML models and libraries that will help with anomaly detection. Now, let me walk you through what uh, our cluster install and AI ops pipeline looks like. So. 
over here we can see the metrics that we were interested in. We were just looking at in the examples, the node local DNS, the CNI error counts and whatnot. And you can actually bucket all of those as part of your aggregation rule and push it down to Prometheus. In fact, Prometheus scrapes, scrape, scrape interval is 30 seconds for us. So it scrapes um, every, uh, one data point every 30 seconds. And then what we have over here is an AIOps namespace that we created in every cluster and installed the NumaFlow controller in it. Now the controller itself in, uh, installs a few special CRDs for pipeline. We'll talk about the pipeline in a bit. For pipeline vertices and there are buffers for each step of the pipeline to make sure that you can, there's flow control between them. And uh, we'll talk about the pipeline. We'll see pipeline, how the pipeline looks. So this thing in purple is com consists of all of the pipeline stages. Prometheus ingests the metrics into our pipeline. The first stage of the pipeline in in input is a window step. Now each metric comes into our pipeline as one data point. However, the ML models that are acting to do the anomaly detection require a window, a sliding window of data. So they don't just act on one. They require a, like a data set. So this step actually works in gaining all of those data metrics and then window, doing the windowing. Then we have the pre-process step, which actually makes the input metrics consumable by the ML models. This part is where any of the transformations that are required are done. And then there is the inference stage, which does the prediction for the anomaly detection. Threshold stage actually does the raw anomaly score calculation based on a previous set of threshold ML models. And from threshold, we go into post-processing, which actually does the normalization of the raw anomaly scores to a normalized range from 0 to 10. And the General idea behind the 0 to 10 mapping is that from 0 to 3, your data points are normally behaving, nothing anomalous about it. From three to seven, there is slightly anomalous behavior. And then from, 10, from seven to 10, it's really anomalous. It's better to actually start alerting the right people. Um, in fact, we have um, AIOP systems in Intuit for services, which automatically create an incident if the anomaly scores over, go over seven, if it's between seven and 10. And then this is also the stage where we push that anomaly score back to Prometheus. So we have a Prometheus pusher that pushes the anomaly score back into Prometheus. And then we have the training stage, which is what trains all of the ML models. And then the, the pre-process, the threshold, and the actual neural network that's training the data, all of that is stored in the ML flow uh, storage that is used back again for inference. So that's overall the, the AI ops pipeline and how, how it, it works. Now, talking a bit more about NumaFlow, you can find more details in um, the GitHub page. And uh, like I mentioned, there are a bunch of CRs that are installed in the cluster and a bunch of other like uh, stateful, uh, basically, there's a Redis uh, deployment, and then there is an interstate buffer service that is installed as part of the AIOps namespace that helps with the different pipeline operations. And it's a, it's, it's insta installs in a few minutes, like lesser than like three, four minutes. And uh, so far, our, the results have been pretty effective. We've been able to get good results for a cluster, and we'll see this in a demo. Uh, where the, we don't need to worry about static thresholds. We can actually just push the data that we need as far as metrics are concerned to our uh, Enuma Proj namespace, and the namespace actually de de detects anomalies depending on the cluster's uh, beh baseline behaviors. And there is a UI that's available using a simple port forward in your cluster. Uh, now, one, one thing that you might be wondering is, hey, you know, I'm a Kubernetes engineer and uh, I don't have much of an experience. Do I need to understand ML? So I, when I started using this project, I, I had the same set of questions as well. So I just put together a FAQ in case you're like me. So do you need ML experience to use this? No. 
but it might be just good to go and look at the GitHub repo just to get an understanding, look at our Slack channels and like engage with us as far as community engagement goes. And then um, what, tell me a little bit about the ML model. How does it work? So the model is actually an auto encoder machine learning model. And what it does is, the way it does anomaly detection is there is some sort of transformation of these uh, data points. And uh, the, when the encoder and decoder cannot actually take this data set and be able to recognize it within, uh, within what is expected, it produces an anomaly. And uh, what is the purpose of retaining models? So basically what we do is uh, we retain about five uh, version for five different ML models at any point in time. And uh, here is why. Let's say you have an incident and uh, that affects a few of your clusters. And the incident is, uh, is not resolved, let's say, for a few hours, right? Now, your ML models are getting trained on this bad data. So it's going to assume that this bad data is not anomalous anymore. In fact, it's going to think that that's normal behavior. Right, so you want to be able to throw away the ML model that's being trained on bad data and you can use the previous model as a backup. And uh, what is the model training frequency? The uh, AIOps systems at Intuit have about an eight hour training uh, frequency. So every eight hours, we, uh, we assume that there will be some sort of data drift, so your model has to get retrained on new data. This is just to make sure that we, can, we, we don't assume that all data is going to be the same, even for a specific cluster, over time. And um, is there a UI to observe the ML flow and the machine learning side of things? Yeah, so this is what it looks like. You can hit it on, like, basically, again, it's like a service. It's, uh, you can do port forward on your lo local cluster. And uh, you will get a nice UI with a lot of details about the ML uh, model. This is just one snapshot that I took of the node local DNS that I was talking about. And uh, you can see that there are five models that have been retained for this particular metric. And uh, only one of them is in production. The other ones are all archived. Uh, and the way to re-trigger a training is to basically change the stage from production to archived, and then it'll trigger a new um, uh, ML model uh, creation. So having said that, um, let's take a look at a demo from Venkat. Looks like I have to switch screens. No, just one. Just yeah, just take away just one more slide. Okay, um, sorry about that little snafu there. 
their audio. in Kubernetes platform. Today, I'm gonna quickly show you a demo on how we are leveraging NumaFlow to detect DNS anomalies. Let me share my screen and quickly walk through the setup. Yeah, okay. Taking a look at this screen, right? And so we have left side, there is a cluster one. On the right side, there is cluster two. And what we are looking at here is the DNS metric on how much success rate we are seeing in the cluster. Okay. Now, this data is backed by amount of requests that are, we are getting into the cluster for DNS calls and amount of serve fails that we are seeing um, in the cluster. So serve fails are super critical in DNS and those happens when the one of the backends of the DNS infrastructure is not performing well or being down. Now, what we are seeing here is that one of the clusters shows the behavior where between 83 and 84% success rate, but whereas other clusters shows 100% success rate. Now, in order to generate an alert for this in a, in a large fleet of clusters, it gets really cumbersome and really hard because you need, to, so let's say this 84% is acceptable in a pre-prod environment or like a, a test cluster where you're constantly doing experimentation. And this is okay in that environment. Now, in order to generate as a platform team to generate an alert that says, hey, right now the DNS is bad or we need to take an action right now, right? So now, because these numbers are so drastically different, whereas one is 84%, another is 100%, and then in production environment, let's say on the right side cluster here, where you cannot even take 5% impact, and that's really big, big deal, right? So now how do we come up with an alert that will satisfy both, right? So now what you end up doing generally is that you end up generally creating every, every single cluster has a separate alert and they have a manual thresholds or something like that. Now, how is there a way to avoid that and then say, hey, I will create a single alert that says that will give me an insight and kind of a golden signal for this, right? Now, what in this demo, what I'm showing you is that the data here, it is generated from node local DNS, is gonna be sent to NumaFlow. Um, NumaFlow will take this gener uh, data and then generate an anomaly uh, metric for it, right? And it is using an ML model behind the scene based on the data we pumped, and then it is generating an anomaly score for us, and which is the same here as well. What we are trying to at least illustrate here is that if the number is below three, that is good. And if we ever breach three, that means there is something wrong and somebody need to take an action and take a look at it quickly, right? Now, I'm gonna introduce um, some failures into the right side cluster, which is cluster two, and see what happens to the uh, anomaly metric. What we expect to see is that it needs to go up from whatever right now it is at one to more than three. So that should trigger an alert uh, that says, hey, there is something wrong. It is no longer 100%. And uh, whereas if we introduce, um, whereas this is not 100% already, and this is okay, meaning this cluster, this behavior is okay. Right? So you can always retrain these models and say, hey, let's say there is a bug and this is not actually correct and we've addressed it and right now it's 100%. Now you can always retrain the uh, NumaFlow models and then get um, get accurate alerts, right? Uh, so, so let me quickly in induce some failures here. Uh, I'm gonna just I just started the failure right now. It'll take about thirty seconds to reflect. Um, after some time, you can clearly see that it's no longer at hundred percent. Cluster two has now six percentage error rate. Most importantly, you can also see that anomaly now went up to 10. Whereas in cluster one, you always had about 17% failure and we never went beyond three. We already concluded that 
going beyond three is bad and somebody need to take a look. And clearly cluster one in this case, even though the failure is only 6%, you would generate an alert. This kind of show you how you can leverage Pneumoflow to generate alerts across large fleet of clusters. This concludes the demo. Thank you very much. So just to summarize what uh, Venkat was saying is we had two clusters with different workloads. The one on the right was uh, pro more prone to errors because let's say it's a pre-prod testing perf environment. So the error rate was always around hovering around 13 to 17%, but the one on the left was a prod environment which had no errors. And he introduced the exact same number of errors for the exact same amount of time in both the clusters and noted that the one on the right, the, there was, it wasn't showing any anomalous behavior. It was, the anomaly score was between one and three. But the one on the left, it immediately shot up to an anomaly score of 10, which shows that in a production environment, we are not tolerant to it and it was not a baseline behavior. So you can actually don't need to worry about static thresholds and you can actually implement golden signals using NUMA, NUMA Proj. Well, that concludes the main takeaway is go check out NUMA Proj. It's a pretty cool project, uh, engage with the community and uh, uh, start implementing cluster golden signals if your platform engineers are getting overwhelmed and you're getting alert fatigue and burdened by uh, on-call. Thank you very much.